Welcome to Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, today, we are honored to be chatting with Councillor Tim Tierney from the City of Ottawa, Ontario. And... Councillor Tierney is also the third vice president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. But before we dive into our interview, a brief moment to acknowledge the support that keeps our show thriving. We want to acknowledge some of our new backers to the show. John from Manitoba, Kyle from Saskatchewan, and Samantha from Ontario. Thank you for helping us grow the show and bring more exciting content to you and your fellow cross-border community members. If you want to join the growing list of supporters, visit crossborderinterviews.ca and pledge your support today for as little as $3 a month. Now, let's get to the interview. Um, so, Tim, I want to start with the basic question, and it's the question that I've been asking a lot of councillors, mayors, wardens, reeves, all the uh, uh, below uh, municipal leaders across this country, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, actually, uh, Chris, I never pictured myself being a politician, per se, ever. Uh, it was my wife that pushed me into it uh, because we uh, had a local school that was going to close in our neighborhood. And I was actually in IT for 15 years, doing quite uh, quite successfully. And uh, they were going to close a local high school that one of my three children were going to go to, or all three, I should say. And my wife said, you're going to fight and we're going to keep this open. So I started up or revived a community association, uh, got it back on the ground and fought the school board and won. And then we had a couple other small things that happened in the community. Like we had a, a, a fire at a hydro plant that destroyed a, a lot of appliances and households in the community. I fought the hydro company and I won. And then they tried to cancel one of the public bus routes. So those were the three things that led me to this because then the public was saying, you're kind of okay at this. You should really think about running. And I ran against a long-term incumbent and I was successful and I've been in this role for 13 years since. So before we start talking about the election, I want to talk about the upbringing and who is Tim. So growing, growing up, was politics discussed at the dinner table? And if so, was it more provincial and federal being from the Ottawa uh, capital or was it uh, municipal and were municipal issues discussed by mom and dad? Just in general, I think municipal issues, but it wasn't even related to the government. It's just, you know, the, the typical uh, crying and whining about potholes and trash and all the usual things. And I grew up in a small village called Constance Bay, which is about 45 minutes from where I live. It's now within the city of Ottawa. And my wife uh, dragged me out 30 years ago. I live on the same street as my in-laws. It's a good thing. And, uh, and uh, this is the community that I've represented since. But from a provincial and federal point of view, not a lot of discussion around around uh, politics in general. So I think everyone was surprised when I decided, yeah, I'm going to do this and make things better. So were you considered a green candidate, like as in a new candidate? Because for someone who had been actively involved in your community, doing the school, uh, trying to keep the school open, making sure you're on community boards, would you consider yourself in 2010 when you actually did get elected and beat it, beat that long-term councillor to be sort of a green new person on the council and not really having the sort of day in, day out knowledge of what it would takes to be a councillor or an elected official? A hundred percent. And I think that's a lot of what uh, the new colleagues, we have 11 new ones at our council table out of 24 in the city of Ottawa now, as you know. And uh, so I'm the old guy, I'm Mr. Rogers of council. Uh, and so I'm actually helping school them. I had some great mentors back in the day between Rainer Blois and Bob Manette and Eli Elshantiri. And you'll really learn the ropes quick, but it's, it's hard. People don't realize you, you start off in office, you have no tools or nothing. They just basically are like, Go ahead and do some case management and figure it out on your own and have a good day. And uh, so I've been fortunate to have some mentors, but now I'm passing that down the road. I've been doing this for 13 years and uh, I've picked up a lot of, as, as a matter of fact, it's myself and one other councillor, Councillor Hubley, that are the two longest serving members on our council at this point. So I feel uh, giving back to our, our green, our green uh, elected officials is something I like doing. 
what's been the biggest eye-opening experience? Because you, you have been on council for 13 years now, and you're just in, entering your new term here. You're rel- relatively a few months in. Um, what's been the biggest learning curve, and what knowledge would you pass on to people who are thinking about putting their name forward for municipal council? Because you've been there. You've seen the highs and lows, I can imagine. And there are people probably watching this right now, and this is where the show sort of comes in, is what advice would you pass down to those people thinking about running for council or even thinking about getting involved locally? Definitely get involved locally first. If you're looking at taking a crack at running for any role within politics, you have to know your neighborhood. Uh, but uh, second, uh, don't um, social media is not true. It's not a real world. Twitter is not a real world. You don't say that, counselor. Come yeah, on. Yeah. I know. Sorry. I, I look forward to your tweet about the show when it comes out. That is real, everybody. Uh, but uh that being said, uh, I think a lot of people get into it and they don't realize a lot of the negativity out there, but it's not real. Uh, it's what you hear at the doors. It's what you hear at the barbecues. Uh, I, I've, I, I witness it all the time. Every election I get into, I'm like, geez, it's getting worse and worse on social media. Maybe I'm going to get hurt by this. And then, no, it's all, I've always gotten reelected with 83%. And uh, it's because you have to work hard within the communities. You have to get out there and talk to people. And that's that's the important part of the job. You can't sit at home and just collect a paycheck. And the other thing is, there's going to be a lot of lows, like you say, Chris. Uh, I think the hardest time has been the last uh, two years in the city of Ottawa. Uh, obviously, we have our problems with our light rail system. Uh, we have problems with uh, with uh, 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 flooding, mass flooding in our city and storms. Uh, and we had the convoy. Uh, and then throw into the mix, uh, people are starting to forget about it now. But COVID was no treat. That was the scariest day in politics for me when we were gathered in one big room and everyone was told, go home. And we didn't come back for a very, very long time. So how do you balance that? Because you're one person on a council of 25 people, if I'm not mistaken, 24 councillors and 20 uh, a new count uh, and a mayor. But how do you balance the needs of all the issues that the city of Ottawa faces without forgetting the people who've elected you? Because you've been elected numerous times with a large majority and you don't do that by not for by forgetting the people who have put you there. But as a counselor, and you know this, you are supposed to be there to represent the city as a whole. So how do you balance the needs of your residents versus the needs of the city? And I, yes, I'm going to quote Spock here by saying the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. But how do you do that? Yeah, you know, it's working collectively on things. I'll give you a prime example. I was fortunate to be able to get the uh, new central library that's being constructed right now across the goal line as chair of a uh, chair of the library board. And that is a, a expensive, but worthwhile project in the city. Some people, uh, even some of my constituents weren't happy with some of the price tag, but it is something that is a citywide project at the end of the day. Um, I, I, you know, I, it, it, it is tough. I won't lie to you. I, I don't sleep a lot in general anyway. It's just something I don't do. And so you know, I, I have a great team. If I didn't have a great team in my office to assist and help me with some of the, you know, more simple questions, you know, they forgot to pick up my garbage. Okay, you know how to contact, you can deal with that stuff. But then there's always the more complicated issues. Uh, neighbor wars are the worst. Uh, that's one thing <laughs> that uh, I, I, I warn all my colleagues, do not get involved in neighbor wars, stay out of those things. Um, but um, yeah, it, it is a bit of a balancing act. Uh, you know, a city budget perspective, obviously, that's citywide. Everyone pays a certain rate and uh, making sure that uh, I balance needs out of my community. But other communities might have a different interpretation. They might don't mind spending more money. I have a lot of seniors in my community. I have a lot of families, uh, needs for uh, policing. Uh, and uh, other parts of the city might not have the same idea. So, yeah, it is a bit of a balancing act for sure. I want to talk about the balancing act with the provincial and federal government as well. And I know this is probably a loaded question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I think there's a very big apathy when it comes to local and municipal politics. And I say that with the with the caveat by, by saying I, the apathy is people just don't know what the jurisdictional roles of each level of government is. And I, I speak to mayors, councillors, Reeves, all that across this country. And I hear time and time again, when they first got elected to now, there's been a change of what people expect from their local councillors and with downloading with 
education, healthcare with COVID-19. Have you seen that change over the last 13 years since you first were elected to today, being being just a municipal councillor to being more of a jack of all trades, but a master of none? Yeah, that's a great way to put it, actually. Uh, no, absolutely, no doubt. Uh, we have prime examples, even on our own city of Ottawa, prior to me being elected, uh, the province downloaded a highway to us, a highway. Uh, that that should be a provincial responsibility, I'm sorry to say. Uh, so we have that uh, housing. Housing is obviously the hot topic these days, uh, you know, finding uh, affordable housing in general and building more housing. A lot of the social services that... Uh, uh, we work with the province to actually dole out and help get people uh, in better positions. Uh, we're taking on more and more of the burden of that. Uh, you know my role with uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. I'm very privileged to uh, now be the third uh, vice president uh, uh, working towards 2026. Uh, uh, having a great mentor like Scott Pierce uh, as president. That guy is uh, quite the character. He's awesome. We like him. And um, But we all are facing a, a very similar pressure. Uh, the provinces always like to remind us we're a corporation of the province uh, and uh, that minimizes uh, in my mind what people think of us. I don't think that's the appropriate term, uh, but when it comes to federal government giving to the provinces that's supposed to come down to us, uh, that's been a big challenge and that's why we continue to work hard on things like uh, formerly called the gas tax, making sure that municipalities receive funding because they can run debt, municipalities can't. So we're yeah. always wrestling about how we do that. So we're going to talk about the issues that municipalities are facing, including Ottawa in a few minutes here, but I want to stick on you and sort of your role as councillor. Um, walking into that council chambers every single time for a council meeting, you have to be knowledgeable on a wide range of issues that are going to face your community, but you have to be prepared to a pivot on some issues. How do you balance your needs to be educated walking into that council chambers with the needs of understanding that you may hear something at that council meeting from a resident, from a fellow co- councillor who may change your mind and change the way you vote. Because I've worked in municipal governments and I've seen councillors just go in and just blanket vote. Yes, no, yes, no, and not have that discussion. How important is that discussion around that council table for you and for your colleagues, do you find? Hugely important, Chris. Uh, I You learn that. Uh, unfortunately, it took me a couple of years to figure that out. Uh, I, you do a lot of reading reports in advance of the meetings, obviously, lots of lots of reading. And then, but at the same token, uh, I always reserve my vote for the table. I, I actually don't really confirm it unless I know it's a, a one specific issue that I am fighting for uh, and I feel strongly about. If it's my motion, obviously, I'm going to vote for it. Um, but um, at the same time, I always wait till I get to the table. If there's more questions, we always go through committee anyway, and there's nothing stopping us from changing our vote that we do at a committee level versus the the council level if there's new details that come out in between and that has happened um so but you know i i like to leave it right at the table because there are these nuances that pop up and you're like hey wait a minute i didn't know about this this is new information to me i want to research it the reason i asked that is because you mentioned his name scott pierce and i i I always feel obligated to send him a check for this quote but he said at the fcm conference in toronto Local government is the government of proximity. You guys are the closest to the people. And I've never uh, attached to words closer than that. And I want to know from you, how do you engage? How do you engage with the government of proximity, the local residents, without being in that echo chamber of social media? Because when you're going to council, you have to try and get an idea of what everyone feels like. And I find that there are some municipal councillors and some local officials, I'm not naming names, but I'm just I'm, I'm not trying to paint a broad stroke here, but they just go to their social medias and they get that's their engagement. But there's people at the doors who don't use social media. And I can imagine, you know, that. So how do you engage with the government of proximity to the closest people and make sure you are hearing all sides of the story? And 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 Scott's line is absolutely correct. That's why I'm wearing the shirt. Uh, <laughs> it's a little tighter these days. But uh, that being said, uh I have uh, very over 13 years amassed a very good system of uh, my e-blast list. It's very, very sizable. Uh, those are my people. I know they are because we, uh, at, at events, I always collect them. Like, please get on this list. I want to hear from you. Uh, so it's a more one and one It's a real person. It's not, you know, something 3,000 on Twitter. And, uh, you know, 
uh, again, a lot of local events. I'm I'm the king of local events uh, in the city. I, I we do about 21 different events a year between uh, barbecues and uh, family movie nights and things like that, and getting out and actually talking to the people. People think, oh well, you're just promoting yourself at these events. No, 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 no. I'm out talking to people. Or uh, halfway through the term, I always well usually every year. I like to go out and do some doors anyway and just check in on people, see how things are going. Every event I go to, people come up and they'll be like, hey, I hate to bug you. I just have one quick question for you. And that's how you get that engagement, find out what's going on. But the grocery store, Chris, I'm a daily shopper, which is painful because I go in for one meal with for my wife. Uh, my wife always picks it out and says, okay, go get this at the local metro. And I get in there and half an hour later, I'm out of there. But uh, staying engaged, staying in the community, you, again, you can't do it from behind the screen. You actually have to get out there and talk to people or have direct contact with them via uh, email. I do a physical newsletter. I still do those. I know some people think they're old fashioned. They're not. There's a lot of no. seniors. They don't, they don't have. So, uh, you know, it's a very expensive, I'll tell you Canada post, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's worth every penny because I have that engagement. And every time I run into people, they're like, Hey Tim, I got your newsletter because the local papers are dead now too. I don't have any local papers in my community. So I have to create my own. Uh, ability to get the information out there. You you must have listened to an episode or two because you you, you sort of stole my question that I was going to follow up here, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Because you're a counselor 24-7. You were a counselor at the events, at the grocery store, wherever you are. You're not, and I, I I can't say this to you because literally your MPs literally live in Ottawa and they're going to be working in Ottawa, and, and but your MPPs go off to Toronto. So how do you balance the personal life of a counselor with the private life of Tim? Because you probably some days are so drained and municipal, municipal governments is a very 24 seven job that you just want to be Tim sometimes and run into the grocery store and run back out with a carton of milk without taking two hours to get it. How do you balance the needs or do you find that you're willing to do that and just screw it. I, I signed up for this. I get elected. I've enjoyed it. And I'm willing to take those two hour milk breaks and talk in the aisle of no frills or superstore. Door number two, Chris, I, I, <laughs> I like the, I like people. Maybe one day I'll change and I'll just be like a uh, curmudgeon and like, oh, I'm not talking anyway. but at this point in my life, uh, I love it. Uh, when I started in politics, I had young kids and now all three of my children are terrific uh, humans. They all have careers. And it's my wife, myself, and my dog, Princess, at home. So now I have even more time for the people. So I enjoy getting out there chatting with people. I mean, I gave up a very lucrative career in IT uh, because it was great to uh, you know, manage a department and have employees and all that sort of stuff. And they were all great people. But I was stuck in, a, you know, stuck in an office all day. I, I want to be out. I want to talk to people. I want to do things. I... The only one downside of, of councils is uh, sitting in a committee meeting that lasts 10, 12 hours. Uh, those aren't fun, but uh, it's part of the job. I want to turn to the issues now. And before I start this, and I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between Councillor Tierney and myself. This is not a motion of a council. This is not a direction of council. I don't know how many times we get emails, even with that preface, but I'm just making sure that this is his opinion. So, Councillor. And I want to start with the big question about Ottawa. In your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Ottawa today? Uh, it's certainly LRT. LRT is our big issue. Uh, when we started our light rail project and started the trains, it was with the idea that we were going to reduce GHGs, uh, that we we're going to have a very successful system. And we don't have that right now. Um, it's had many breakdowns. Uh, I want to see the success. I represent a, a ward in the city called Beacon Hill, Searville, and it's uh, the next, well, one of the next stages of the train. Uh, I have two stations uh, at Searville and and uh, uh, Searville and Blair Station right now, but I'll be getting Montreal Road Station. It will continue all the way out east to Trim, and that is, in my mind, going to be where things get a lot better because now you're going to have a more speedy system. You're going to have a spoken hub style with the buses, so. Transit is uh, is probably the number one current issue. It's going to take a while to resolve, as we've been hearing in the news. Uh, but of course, we, we do have a very big uh, homeless situation that's taking place right now as well. And there's a lot of challenges that go along with that. We need the assistance 
and help of our federal partners for sure. And we're advocating for a lot of that through FCM. Uh, but uh, the provinces do have a role as well. So it should be all hands on deck. We're seeing it happen. Uh, crime rates have uh, jumped for theft in my area as well. So we're seeing a lot of these new problems that we never really had here before. And uh, um, it's it's becoming a little more challenging these days, but we're working on it. Now, if I would have asked you that question in 2010 when you were first elected, would you have said the same thing, do you think? Or do you think it would have been something different? Or has these three issues that you just talked about, homelessness, transit, and uh, housing, become kind of the staple of the issues that are facing Ottawa? Because what I talked to mayors and Reeves, they're saying the exact same thing. So in 2010, when you got elected, would you have said those three things as well? And not at all. Uh, you're quite correct. Uh, I think back in in the old days, it was all about the tax rate, and it was about paving roads and potholes and light bulbs and all the great things that municipal politics used to be. Uh, but now, like you, we mentioned earlier in the interview, um, that's that's not the new world for a municipal politician anymore. It's take, it being everything to everybody. So there's no there's no lanes in politics anymore, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. But we do need the assistance of our federal government partners for sure. So how is the city of Ottawa trying to adapt to these new issues? Because um, it is an all-hands-on-deck uh, analogy here because the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipalities all have to come to the ta same table, but they aren't. And I'm not trying to be rude there, but they're not. And it's hard for municipalities to thrive and try to fix issues like transit, like housing, like homelessness, when they don't have all three party parties at the table. What are you doing as councillor and what is the city of Ottawa doing as a municipality to ensure that these issues are addressed at the Queen's Park and the House of Commons? Yeah, and, and, and a great question. It's, you know, as a, as a, from a city perspective and a councillor perspective, uh, you you hit the nail on the head. We have all our federal partners here working out of Ottawa. So they're the ones that are walking down the sidewalks, uh, seeing homeless, uh, seeing all the problems that we're having. Drugs, drugs. I The, the drug situation aggravates me a lot, uh, uh, especially over the last six years. Uh, uh, you know, fentanyl, it's out of control. Um, we're, we need help with these kind of issues. And, you know, when I put my FCM hat on, uh, that's why uh, 2,000 member municipalities plus, we all get ourselves on the same line because we don't, you can't ask a million things. You got to be specific in your ass, but these ones are specific. It's about helping with the, the, uh, the drug problems, helping with the homeless, uh, helping with the housing. And we go in and we advocate to all the MPs on, and ministers on the Hill on a regular basis. But then we also have our other arm, which is our association's uh, like uh, like uh, AMO, which uh, works with uh, Ontario, uh, the 444 municipalities. And we also link up and chat and try to figure out, because we have the same issues. We all have the yeah. same issues and, and it helps us lobby all for the same kind of thing. Do you see FCM playing a major role in the next few years while you're trying to address these issues? Because like you just said, in 2026, you're going to be the president. And who knows what the issues are in 2026 are going to be. We may new have a new federal government. You may have a new provincial government. So we don't know what the issues are going to be. So as you're navigating the third vice president, soon to be second in Calgary in 2024, what are you doing to ensure that the issues federally for the Federation is dealing with are addressed as well? Because you're the city councillor for Ottawa. You're a, a local boy. It seems like you want to represent your local municipalities, but you've decided to go, let's, let's do this on a federal level as well. So how do you ensure that the issues federally in, in can, in Calgary, in Edmonton, Regina, Winnipeg, so on and so forth are addressed because you're right, they are the same issues, but the uh, how you solve them are going to be different for Edmonton compared to Saskatoon compared to Ottawa, aren't they not? You're certainly right, Chris, and we talk about this all the time collectively as a group, as a board. Uh, we meet uh, four times or three times a year, forgive me, and we have our advocacy days on the Hill where we speak to MPs and ministers, but we also have the AGM, and you know how fun those are. Some people think it's a junket, but Actually, if you really take part in it, uh, we have our resolutions, our plenary sessions, and we collect that feedback. And you're, you're quite right. Saskatoon might not be looking at a light rail project. So, you know, while we're advocating for transit and a lot of the larger municipalities, 
uh, we have to ensure that there's something there for people that need transit from a busing perspective. So yeah, it, it's always hard. Uh, we have had heavy discussions on on some things, uh, but uh, FCM is a very, um, we're under great leadership with Carol Saab as the CEO. Uh, we She collects and her staff collect all the information from across the country so we can form and sing from the same songbook. And you're you're very correct about Elections are coming up. We don't know. It yeah. could be within the next year. And uh, it, our phones start ringing quite a bit uh, when we when we get closer to election time from all the parties. And uh, and while I say that, they've been very helpful. They, we always have a keynote speaker uh, pretty much from every party to come out to all of our events, to our discussions, to our board meetings. So they're always engaged to keep that engagement. And that's the power of numbers. I mean, if we were smaller numbers, maybe we wouldn't have the ear of the federal government. But working collectively, working from one songbook, keeping our list of requests to what we think is the most important cross country from a population of 500 to a population of 1.2 million. You, okay, I want to ask this question correctly. So I apologize if I stumble here a few seconds. You were there as the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to represent everyone, all the member organization municipalities. And it's sort of the similar question that I asked earlier on about the city of Ottawa, but I'm going to ask it federally. Every municipality may have the three top issues that they're dealing with, housing, drugs, uh, homelessness, transit. But then there's the individual issues, the individual issues that municipalities are facing. How do you see yourself as third vice president and also as the Federation of Canadian Municipalities of making sure all municipal issues are addressed, but the big ones go to the 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 uh, MPs? Because you don't want to piss off, and I'm, I apologize for being rude there, but you don't want to anger your municipal members by saying your issue is not that important, whether it be a new water treatment plant, because right now the big issue across Canada is housing. And, and I'm, I'm being blunt there. It is housing. I don't care who you are. It's housing. How do you how do you balance the needs of the individual member municipalities with the overarching theme of what FCM is trying to accomplish? Yeah, great question. Hard question. Uh, you know, we, we do find a way to make it work and we do recognize even some of the smaller municipalities and their needs. Uh, a good example, we've been talking about it recently. Uh, the federal government has put out programs that as larger municipalities, it's easier to access grant money. Um, but small municipalities, they don't have grant writers. They don't have, they're risking a big chunk of their budget to be able to do these kind of things. So we're out there advocating for them as well. I've even brought it up in my council that we're fortunate that we have professional grant writers in our city uh, where the smaller ones can't even get access to the funds that are truly available to the larger municipalities because we have the, the uh, person power to be able to actually get those things done. Um, when it comes to things like you're talking the water treatment plant, a good example, actually, um, uh, the Green Municipal Fund, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure you're aware of that. It's uh, Alan it's D'Souza. Hard. Come on. I know Alan. <laughs> Isn't he great? The guy is He's awesome. awesome. <laughs> so so being able to, to, uh, to make sure that we really, as FCM, show the small municipalities, we have opportunities for you. And that's why it's very important to join FCM because uh, for their membership fees, and it's scaled based on the size, uh, they get great opportunities to access that federal money through GMF and to get a water treatment facility, to be able to get some resiliency within their community for storms. Uh, all those kind of things that are really important. And that's why I, I truly, I've been on FCM uh, 11 years, uh, Ontario Caucus Chair for 10, and uh, I truly believe we make a big, big difference for municipalities. So what does the future hold for the city of Ottawa when it comes to issues? But what does the future hold? Because we talk about the issues, but let's 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 leave it on a positive note before we talk about my favorite subject is tourism. What do you see as sort of the future of the city of Ottawa? And I know you're laughing about tourism, but I, I like it. I, I went to your city just I recently it. and I, I toured your city just by myself and my mom. And it was great. And I got to see firsthand some of the issues and some of the things that I, I love seeing, but for you, what what does the future hold for your city of Ottawa? Uh, I, I, you know what? I feel very positive. I think uh, we do have our challenges that are going to be ahead of us. We just saw this big, I'm not sure if you, you saw, uh, we had a massive flood situation. So we're always going to have new challenges and, you know, um, climate, uh, climate change, 
all the things that come along with it. We have, there'll always be new issues, but I do, I'm very excited. We have, uh, you know, a new uh, owner of the NHL franchise, the Ottawa Senators, uh, possibility of seeing that move downtown, changing, uh, the, the, the city is changing. This new central library joint between Library and Archives Canada and ourselves is gorgeous. Uh, TD Place looking at making some changes there. So there's a lot of really neat citywide projects uh, we're not sleepy hollow. Some people think we are, but we actually do have a very vibrant city. And now it's just trying to find our way over the next few years about people going back to work or not going back to work and the challenges that come along with that too, because we have a great buyer market. We've got a great downtown, but we also have great communities outside of the downtown as well. And we're seeing a lot of big differences taking place out there. So I want to talk tourism because I am cautious of time here and I know you're a busy man. So I want to start with this. We all know that Ottawa is the home of the House of Commons and Parliament Hill, and that's a big tourist market. But I want to know the hidden gems. I want to know the off the beaten path. Where do you go? Where do you send people that most people don't know is in Ottawa and you would highly recommend them see if they're visiting the nation's capital next week or next month or even next year when I'm there? <laughs> Awesome. I can't wait till you're here. Chris, when you're here next year, uh, we're going for a scoop. That's something yes. that's kind of cool in this city. And uh, we are actually one of the municipalities that uh, really led the charge. We got the new smart scooters. So you go for a nice scoop downtown, go for dinner. We have a lot of great restaurants. Uh, I probably shouldn't name some of them, but we've got, we've got some really good. I'll stay kiss. I, I like it. Sorry. Um, uh, there's a couple of uh, great uh, scenic areas as well that I think people just don't know about. We've got some uh, nice uh, caves out in the Orleans area. Uh, we got uh, we got beautiful uh, farmers area. But one spot uh, that I'm a, a, a big supporter of is craft beer, and we have some of the coolest craft beer spots in the entire country. I actually jokingly um, um, speak to other uh, councillors and mayors across the country, and we exchange local craft beers. I got one called Dominion City Brew Company. It's right in my ward. And it's uh, now turned into a, a large facility. It's got a great bakery called Almanac Bakery. And uh, it's all these little cool kitschy things that I kind of like. I mean, it, you know, there's things for franchises, uh, franchise restaurants, but I like the smaller, the more local touristy kind of things. And, uh, oh, I wish I knew this because I'm going to, as soon as we're finished this call, I'm going to remember 100 things that you should check out. But Science and Technology Museum is great. They've done a great job. We've got a lot of great museums in the city that I don't think a lot of people even know about. And, uh, you know, take the time and check it out. Where do you go after a stressful day? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day of committee meetings, is there a place that you go in town or in the city that you can just go and just decompress? And before you answer, I know the joke is going to be, yes, you're going to say your house so that way you can just relax, but I'm going to hold you against it and say, you can't say your own house. You have to say somewhere in the city. Okay. Well, you know, for the couple of days that uh, I get to decompress, which is very <laughs> rare, I, I, I pro I'll, you can probably find me at uh, at one of the local restaurants in the area, just hanging out with some friends. Or uh, I we have this beautiful uh, Sensplex in my area. It's a four pad. It was actually my first promise, Chris. I, I I made this promise during the 2010 election that we need a new ice ice uh, arena, and we only had a single pad. It was small. And I, as soon as I got elected, I went, how am I going to make this work? I just made a promise that I'll never be able to deliver on. And I did. It opened in 2014. Uh, it's cool up there. They got video golf. Uh, they got uh, awesome restaurants. So I'll go in there sometimes. And I'm a horrible golfer, but uh, it's for fun and hit the balls around and have a good time. And that's, that's, pre I'm pretty boring. I'm, uh, I'm not super exciting. I, back in my heyday, I was, I was, you know, DJ in hall and did all that sort of crazy stuff. But now I'm a, now I'm just a municipal councillor, um, Mr. Rogers. I want to end with the second last question, and then I'm going to ask the big question to end this. And I should have asked this at the beginning, but it's a question that uh, uh, one of your councillor, one of your council colleagues from Mississauga, who actually got me thinking about this more often. And I want to know from you, what does community mean to T councillor Tim Tierney, the city councillor for Ottawa? Yeah, you know what? Uh, I, I'm blessed where where we are in this city. Uh, we're 15 minutes from downtown, uh, but we also have a very tight knit community. Like tight knit, um, you can see it. For, look, I, while I poo poo a lot of social media like X or Twitter or whatever you want to call it today, um, 
Facebook, Facebook is real personas, real people. And all the people I see in our local community area all help each other out. And we saw it like really up front with COVID. Uh, it was unbelievable how people were helping each other out, how people were out on our local streets, uh, just talking to each other, staying away from each other, but keeping those conversations going, help delivering food. Um, I, I, it really is a, a host of everything from local recreation um, to getting together as a community to community supports. Uh, I have a, a food cupboard, a Gloucester emergency food cupboard that helps a lot of people and the community comes together and helps stock that on a regular basis. Those are the kind of things that make a community um, it, it, and getting people to talk to each other, I think is really important as well. So yeah, that's kind of, I think that would be my definition of community is just uh, a lot of people that get along with each other and make sure that uh, we're doing the best for, for the area. So my last question, and it's kind of a big question, it's a loaded question, but why should uh -oh. people, can, why should people care about municipal issues? Oh, bar none. Uh, we're the closest to the people, as you said. Uh, we actually, uh, a lot of people have no clue who their MP or MPP is, and that's that's not a shot. Uh, it's the truth. Uh, it's because they know every time they pick up a phone and, or send an email, uh, it's coming to my office, and we actually help parcel that off. I have a great relationship with my MPP and MP, but uh, it is the face that is known. Everyone knows who their municipal politician is. Uh, they know who their mayor is, um, and we're we're there on the ground. We're it, we we are from the morning when you flush your toilet, Chris, to have a shower, to plow the roads, to do the sidewalks, to the local rink. That it's all municipal services. I actually go out. So I've done this for 13 years. Uh, in Ontario, it's mandated. Uh, grade five has a civics program. Uh, I always uh, go into their classrooms, and teach them about municipal politics. And then I bring them down to city hall and stuff them full of pizza and send them back home. And guess what? A couple of years later, oh, I do it every year. A couple of years later, uh, I'll be out walking around and uh, th that student that I went in their class that was really excited and got really engaged in it. They come up to me at the local grocery store, you know, mommy, mommy, look, it's Tim. And, you know, that that kind of engagement, it's right there. Like we're, we're right in front of everybody all the time. We're not. I think that's the thing We're we're. We, we create bylaws and, and do all these wonderful things. We, we're not just policy wonks. We actually get stuff done. Tim, I want to thank you so much for this. This has been an absolute pleasure talking for 40 minutes about yourself, the city of Ottawa, FCM, uh, housing, uh, homelessness, uh, scooters for some reason, a beer, craft brewery. So thank you so much for doing this. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. And uh, next year, let's go for a scoot and then uh, we'll catch up also in Calgary. Maybe we'll find a bucking bronco or something out there while we're out there. Who knows? Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay talking.